Welcome all you dear space ladies and spacemen to the escape pod. Today we're taking a look at Behavior Interactive's little birthday boy of an asymmetrical horror game, Dead by Daylight. While not the first of its kind, since its debut 5 years ago, it has overcome any competitor thrown at it, even cannibalizing the developer team's very own Death Garden, which barely survived a year, if you're not counting early access, that is. As for me, although I can't quite remember whether or not I picked up the game straight at launch, but I've certainly been playing on and off since 2016, I've reached rank 1 with both Survivor and Killer, if that means anything to you, and while Steam claims I have over a thousand hours of experience, I'd say more realistically that's around 800-ish, if you discount all the time I just left the game running for hours on end. All that being said, let's jump into the fog and take a look at what Dead by Daylight is all about. Being an asymmetrical horror title, Core gameplay revolves around two opposing teams, where one would have a major strength advantage, and the other would fight that strength advantage with the numbers on their side. In DBD's case, this means one player selects and controls one of the many killers, and their goal is to hunt down the survivors, one by one, to offer a sacrifice for the mysterious entity. At the same time, four players would join as survivors, but they don't have any means to take down the killer. Instead, at the start of any match, seven generators are spawned at semi-random locations, out of which they need to repair five in order to power up the exit gates and escape. On a surface level, this sounds like a really intriguing concept, but let's take a look at the possible hiccups one by one. First up, there's the matter of how interesting the two sides are, and not gonna lie, Baseline survivor gameplay is pretty much as dull as dishwater. Your job is to hide when the killer is near, then hop on a generator and hold down left mouse button. Occasionally, you'll mix this with a skill check that you can tackle by hitting space at the right time. Alternatively, you can search for totems to break, which by the way you also accomplish by holding down the left button, or break hooks by holding left click. Neither of these last two activities, however, are essential for you to accomplish your ultimate goal of escaping. Most of the time, focusing all your left button skills on a generator is good enough and let's be honest, there's nothing fun in that. Every so often, the killer will find you and you'll get into a chase for your life. This can get way more interesting based purely on your own playstyle. You can get away with just holding shift W to run in a straight line and just drop every single pallet you come across, which is the obvious dead boring approach. But as long as the killer commits to chasing you, sadly, this can actually be the best approach if your team just sits on gens repairing all this time, as you can buy more than enough time for them to secure a win. Alternatively, you can try to play smart and cheeky, mind gaming the different loops, greeting with the pallets instead of insta dropping them, and in the long run, this is actually way more effective and more importantly, a much more enjoyable experience. But it's at best arguable whether this is even necessary nowadays due to some, let's say, questionable map design decisions. On the other side of this equation, however, playing a killer demands a lot and keeps you busy the entire match. First, you have to scooby-doo it all up and find those meddling kids, once on their trail, you need to hit them twice and then hook them. To get a survivor out of the game, you need to rinse and repeat 3 times, a total of 12 hooks to get rid of everyone. Beyond this, you need to try and figure out and keep in mind the skill set of the 4 players. Meanwhile, they obviously just need to pay attention to the one killer. Finally, while survivors have unlimited time to achieve their win condition, as long as they can remain hidden, Killers are on the clock from the very first second, every generator completed marks a loss that cannot be regained. 
Add to this recipe how you, as a survivor, can queue up with three friends that you're obviously in voice comms with, broadcasting among yourselves the killer's every step, and it's easy to see how much rougher it can get playing killer than how it is to play as a survivor. At the same time, however, playing killer, you have the luxury of picking from 24 mostly different experiences. You've got some stealthers, some ranged weapon based ones, those that can rush from one end to the other in seconds, and of course the main attractions, licensed killers from other IPs, Mikey Boy, Freddy, Amanda and more. As said earlier, while it's easy to point out similarities between a lot of them, small differences still keep them feeling fresh. For example, the Huntress's projectile if it hits instantly removes a health state, while the trickster needs to stack multiple hits to achieve similar results. In exchange, Letter at least throws at a much higher speed. For survivor players, variety initially stems from the unique perks each survivor comes with, but having put enough time in the game, those eventually all become available for any other survivor, and at that point, basically every character just becomes a reskin of one another for practically all means and purposes. Before we look at these perks, however, we quickly have to touch on the so-called blood points. After each game, based on your performance, you'll be rewarded these blood points, an in-game currency used to level up your characters in the blood web. The blood web offers a bunch of consumables you can make use of during the trials, some offerings, and based on your level, one to four perks you can pick up. The offerings assist you through altering visibility, certain spawns, or blood point gain. As for the items, survivors can bring first aid kits, toolboxes, maps, and keys that are just flat out infuriating, we'll get back to those later. The killer, instead of items, has add-ons that either enhance their power, or in certain cases, completely alters it. Personally, I'm not a big fan of this system, as it promotes a cycle of having to play to earn resources that you then have to spend to be able to play at baseline killer strength, but the devs have stated multiple times this is the way they like it, so I guess whatever. I myself prefer playing add-on less, I would say 99% of the time anyway. And then we finally get to the perks. Every survivor and killer comes with three unique perks. There's also a handful of neutral perks you can run on your characters, and at certain breakpoints, if you've leveled given character high enough, you're guaranteed offered so-called teachable versions of the signature perks. After unlocking these, the perks become available to all killers or survivors respectively. While the system was arguably an acceptable base of progression on game release, by now, 20 chapters later down the line, it's not even acceptable as a joke. As of today, there are 84 different killer perks and 95 different survivor perks in Dead by Daylight. To add salt to injury, they all come with three tiers, and while not always the case, there's usually a notable strength difference between the separate tiers. Admittedly, I couldn't even be bothered to pay attention to how much it costs to fully deck out a character, but we're talking multiple millions of blood points for just one. To illustrate the point, as I said at the start, I currently would guess I have around 800-ish hours of playtime in DBD. In this time, I've managed to max out my main survivor and 9 out of 24 killers. The other 15 aren't even remotely close. This grind is 100% completely unreasonable and unacceptable. I'm guessing the idea here was to give the player something to do while only 4 survivors were in the game at launch, adding 3 tiers of perks to triple the time you'd spend, but 5 years down the road, we've got more than 3 times the crap to unlock, this entire artificial time waster should have just been completely removed already. Good news is, you don't even remotely need to have every single perk unlocked to play and have fun, especially if you're playing Survivor, as long as you know the basics of looping, you can just slap on any combination of perks you want and have fun. If you're playing a killer at high ranks without any slowdown perks though, well, let's just say you're not gonna have the best time. 
Another major perk related issue stems from certain perks going straight against the core rule set of DBD and these perks end up being referred to as toxic almost immediately by players from the other side. Survivors I feel have more of these perks, mostly in the form of a group commonly referred to as second chance perks that literally give you a get out of jail free card in case you make a mistake. Decisive Strike, Borrowed Time, Death Hard are just a few of these that literally break the rule of the killer having to hit survivors twice at most and then they could hook them. Another one would be Iron Will that 100% reduces your grants of pain. Not only does this completely negate one of the key aspects of killer gameplay, which is locating by sound, but it also cannibalizes multiple other perks that would offer the same effect, but at a cost. Last but not least, personally, I think all exhaustion perks are dumb and should be removed. Holding W is powerful enough as it is right now, there's no need to further boost it, the only exception here would be head-on, which is a completely different case. It allows you to stun jumping out of a locker, which, by the way, is also counterplayable and niche enough that I would argue it probably doesn't even need to be an exhaustion perk. Out of all of these, Borrowed Time, which was originally designed to combat tunneling survivors, is the only reasonable perk I honestly think Getting rid of all the others would make for a much healthier experience and could open up space for actual variance in survivor perks instead of just seeing the same build over and over again. Don't get me wrong however, killers also have their own game breaking mechanics, with the two most notorious ones probably being no one escapes death that activates once all generators are completed and gives increased move speed and the ability to instantly down survivors, plus the combination of Hex Undying and Hex Ruin, which removes the requirement of having to interact with generators to reduce the progress of repair survivors have already achieved. As for Noed and other perks that expose the survivors and allow one hit downs, I think they are just as bad as survivor second chance perks. They also mess with the same rule of two hits before a hook, which on the one hand I don't think there's any reason to mess with, it's fine as it is, but more importantly it just results in a shitty experience on the receiving end, which I believe a game should attempt to do anything to avoid. The Ruin Undying combo is slightly different, it's in a much more manageable position than it was before it got nerfed, but with all honesty it's still a case of one side having to feel shitty 9 out of 10 times. Either the survivors fail to ever find the totems because of map layout and they get to feel poop, or the totems would just spawn out in the open, get instantly cleansed and it's the killer who gets to feel crap. To be fair though, this is more a matter of hex perks in general being poorly designed and needing a complete overhaul. To me, the obvious solution would be making them passive perks that start out weak and get stronger as more gems pop, but the community has given many great ideas over the years. Either way, the common pattern here is that certain perks just make the game experience miserable for the other side and guess where that leads. If your first thought was a toxic community, well congratulations. This can be experienced in-game, during prime moments such as survivors waiting at the exit gate to teabag the killer, delusional killers showing their dominance by repeatedly melee attacking survivors on the hook, or just loading into post-game lobby and being shit-talked out of nothing. Don't get me wrong, none of the previously mentioned issues with that by daylight are a valid reason for such trash behavior, but it does provide an ideal climate for such to grow and bloom in all of its toxic beauty. You can't just blame a handful of perks for this though, previously mentioned keys can have a property to them which allows for survivors to just escape the trial with absolutely no counterplay option whatsoever from the killer's side, or just taking a look in general at the top tactics highlights how they involve activities that just feel completely crap to go against. For example, 
just running and slamming pellets to waste time as a survivor, or flat out tunneling out the first survivor you found as a killer. Unfortunately, until the developers investigate and eliminate the root cause behind the overall toxicity, banning people won't be anything more than a band-aid and it'll stay present moving forward, especially considering the low entry price to grab a new account at practically any time. Luckily, however, this community also boasts an awesome content creator cast and a boatload of community-created in-game interactions which more than make up for the toxic portion. Examples to the latter are these niche situations you can find yourself in when, if you and the others involved have been around long enough, you can partake in these seemingly absurd scenes. For example, the killer holding a slug race through the exit gate, or the occasional pig killer that would let you go as the last survivor if you're kind enough to boop their snoot, maybe realizing the killer just wants to have a chill game farming blood points and that's the actual reason why he's wildly flailing at generator himself and not because he's having a nervous breakdown. Another one seems to have been forgotten lately, but back a few years ago, while on the hook for the first time, you would just remain still as long as the killer was around and then signal once they are gone. Nowadays, people just seem to have forgotten this signal and they just wave around like buffoons out of boredom. And as for the content creators, just to name a few, there's Potato Legion who streams both killer and survivor to his cuties and provides a glimpse into what it's like to be on the receiving end of the previously mentioned toxicity through his thought compilations on YouTube. As a side note, he's also probably related to Mickey Mouse based on his goofy laugh. Yeah. Dowsy is probably most known for his hardcore survivor and killer series, where he attempts to reach max rank starting from zero on a new account and can no longer play any character once they die in a trial, but recently he also released a coaching session which was pretty neat and hopefully more to come. If you're looking for fun compilations, Zubat delivers with a hysterically stoic expression on his face while pulling off amazing looking plays in game. One can simply not not mention the poor Spaniard, Otsdarva, who has been murdered by a mimic and now shamelessly runs the show under the alias not Otsdarva and beyond gameplay videos also delivers a completely unreasonable amount of newcomer friendly educational content no matter whether you look at the frequency or the length of these videos. And speaking of educational content, there's probably a manhunt going on for Fungus, the educational rap god of Dead by Daylight, who has sadly gone missing from the scene not too long ago. As we touched on the rank system just a minute ago, we might as well take a look at it and also Dead by Daylight's victory conditions as well, as if anything, these are the biggest gaping holes in design. After each trial, just as you get your share of blood points, your actions will also earn you points in 4 categories and based on the final sum, you will potentially rank up. To do so, you're generally expected to carry out a wide assortment of tasks throughout the game, for example, if you're playing survivor and all you do during the trial is sit on gens, you're quite unlikely to pip especially if you just let some other player rot on hook, because in that case you can expect heavy minus points. Similarly, if you play killer and spend the entire game chasing one person, then face camping them, that's going to be a big fat F- minus as well. On the other hand though, if you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of Monica and Jessica in the sun, as a survivor, contribute somewhat to everything, as a killer, chase and down people, kill let's say two of them and avoid losing all five gens in the first three minutes, you can safely assume you'll rank up. 
While this sounds great, the two big problems here are 1. There's not a single living casual player on the planet that would have the slightest idea how any of this works. Heck, I'd wager, most of the experienced players also suffer from lack of knowledge in this department. 2. We stated at the start of this whole thing that as a survivor, your goal is to get out and as a killer, it is to kill the four survivors. Now, however, we're saying you can rank up even if you die during the trial or without killing everyone. Well, what the hell is going on then? I honestly think no one knows. Pretty sure not even behavior themselves do, as would be evidenced by this mess. To me, personally, the goal of DBD is to have fun and to do so without that being at the cost of the four other players in the lobby, but to you, or little Timmy over in West Virginia, it might be totally different. As for visuals, Dead by Daylight sure is pretty, especially if you compare it to where it came from. While environmental details, such as grass for example, or the basic ground texture, can look, let's, let's be honest, low quality, I'd certainly call the overall aesthetics pleasing to the eye. And, Behavior attempts to keep on top of this situation with constant graphical updates and reworks. The only issue here worth mentioning is how dark the game is, which on one hand makes complete sense given the horror game nature, but if you combine this with certain dark survivor outfits, it can become borderline impossible to spot them sitting in pitch black corners. Many killer mains counter this by just setting brightness to max, but 1. That makes the game look upsettingly bad. 2. It's not your job as the consumer to solve issues with a product, but the developers. Sounds are in a similar situation. Most often they are on spot, repairing a generator sounds like you're tinkering, ambient background noises make sense, same goes for the killer sounds, but certain survivors just come with extremely weird sound files that just sound way off and on top of that there are some returning sound issues with down survivors being completely silent or we could just say Claudette sound files altogether. Music isn't really a thing in DBD other than the iconic main menu theme and chase music and while both are generally great, latter for killer players is purposely implemented in a way for it to be annoying and distracting during chases, so whatever. No doubt, I've seen a game crash or two over the years, but to be fair, compared to the time I have in DBD, I'd say those are close to non-existent. Unfortunately, in their stead are network issues, even beyond your standard latency issues like any other online game, DBD sees disconnects quite often, although I couldn't even begin to guess to estimate the percentage of occurrence, as people also just rage quit whenever someone doesn't play as they want them to. An even more annoying issue, however, is the presence of bugs, which seem to pop up with every new chapter. Just as an example, currently the clown's bottle doesn't work only a fraction of the time, but there have been issues with survivors' moans of pain since forever, and the most atrocious instance was the release of the Twins chapter when you could pay for DLC content that wasn't even finished. On a more positive note, you could have just spent from your in-game currency to unlock the contents released in that chapter as you can with most of the released content. As you play, you also earn so-called iridescent shards and 9000 of those would unlock most any killer or survivor you don't own yet, only exceptions being the licensed characters in the game, which are only accessible via real-world currency. Maps released are available to anyone, despite whatever DLC content they would own, which is most certainly a plus. Another positive aspect to mention is that even though it usually takes some time, well, a lot of time, but 
Behavior has definitely shown they are open to listening to the community in certain cases, as with the incident when they finally reworked Mori's, which were offerings that allowed killers to just kill off survivors after their first hook, but now they're practically just a set of animations you can replace the last hook with. On a completely unrelated note, the game also has a hard shortcoming of explaining certain in-game mechanics, such as Hindered, Oblivious and others, which is the weirdest thing since all the developers would need to do is add a little book icon or button to the main menu called the Book of Trials or whatever, where all of this baseline terminology could just be added for players to read through and understand. Here's hoping one day a random intern would be tasked with this approximately two hours worth of workload. I've mentioned many, many, many negative aspects of Dead by Daylight. One might even rightfully claim they are overwhelming and, based on this, just flat out write off DBD completely. However, I think it can't be overstated how the game offers an outstandingly unique experience to those willing to give it a chance. First, you'll jump in as a survivor, crouch around shitting your pants after any and every random squeak you hear, fail most of the skill checks coming at you and instantly run to hide in the nearest corner for minutes just to be sure you're safe, and every chase you get into will end up with you running face into walls due to sheer panic. I know you think you're the exception and you will do better, but believe me, each and every one of us started out like this, and I'd even dare to wager, most of us would happily trade in all our experience and knowledge just to relive these times of being hilariously incompetent, but still enchanted by the atmosphere. Once you get past this phase, you look to learn a few tricks, you'll realize the heartbeat isn't as dangerous as you once thought, and as you get better you'll probably start to care less and less about the core gameplay loop, but instead, look for your own way of having fun within the boundaries. You'll probably then dip your toes in killer waters and bask in the glorious feeling of being almighty at low ranks against other players that are just as clueless as we all were once. You'll quickly reach the rank of semi-competent survivors who will give you a fair run for your money, but then come high ranks and pre-made teams that will over and over feel free to use your butt cheeks to wipe the sweat off the floors of the trials, and you'll wish you never actually started down this road, but if you keep practicing, I promise you, the magic will return slowly but surely as you get better. Just one of these emotional roller coasters in a single game is something that is hard to achieve. Having 2-2 experience is as rare as killers running the perk Cruel Limits, and I'm pretty sure the entire community agrees. If anything, then this is what makes DBD worthwhile to experience, and it easily outweighs the cons. Just like that, we finally reached the end of this review, and maybe discussion piece, and the time is here to say our loving goodbyes. We hope you found what you came looking for, if you did, we'd be very grateful if you pleased the machine gods by liking our video, if you'd like to come along for our next deep dive, don't hesitate to subscribe, if you have any game that you'd like for us to check out, let us know in the comments section, kindly avoid using the sun as a grill, and we'll see you again soon.